For more on the impact of that special election, as well as some congressional retirements, it's time for Politics Monday with Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter and Tamara Keith of NPR. Great to see you both, as always. So let's pick up where Lisa left off there. What stands out to you, Amy, about this special election? And also, what are you going to be watching for? Uh, that's right. I mean, special elections are special. <laughs> they are unique. So <laughs> I don't want to overgeneralize. But Lisa's piece was really spot on, which is it's getting national attention because of two reasons. One, it's a swing seat. And two, it's a, it's a district in which the migrant crisis is literally in its backyard. So the debate over what to do about it is actually playing out politically mm -hmm. in real time. And while, again, this is a unique, we're in a unique period of time in one unique district, I do think for folks in Congress looking at this race, um, the decision by the Democrat in the race to talk about wanting to have something like border security mm -hmm. bill, like the... Uh, the bipartisan bill in the Senate and the Republicans saying no, um, what that will tell leaders in Congress going forward, I think, will be very important. And this is one of those very uh, important swing seats that will determine who controls the House in 2024. Not saying if Democrats win, it means they win the House. Republicans win, they win the House. But it's the kind of place that actually is going to be critical. What about you, Tam? What are you watching? Well, it is a rare election year trial run early yeah. in an election year yeah. where uh, various groups and, and the parties are trying things out that we might see later in the election year in other congressional yeah. races or even in the presidential race in terms of on-the-ground tactics. Mm -hmm. So watching to see how those experiments that are happening turn out. Um, and then also just what's up with the weather? Uh, <laughs> um, it's supposed to snow tomorrow. That's right. Um, there, you know, there's this sort of raging debate in the Republican uh, Party about whether you bank your vote or whether you always vote on Election Day. And snowstorms are the kind of things that are why uh, parties try to bank their votes. Mm -hmm. So seeing how that plays out in this race will yeah. also I be I love when election sure. coverage also becomes weather coverage. Oh. Mm -hmm. Believe me. I know. Look at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, in the House, I want to talk about some other shifts we're seeing. The fact that Wisconsin Congressman Mike Gallagher, who's been a rising star in the Republican Party, a leading national security voice as well, announced he will not run for re-election. Here is what he said in part in a statement. He said, the framers intended citizens to serve in Congress for a season and then return to their private lives. Electoral politics was never supposed to be a career. And trust me, Congress is no place to grow old. <laughs> Amy, he's in his fourth term. He's only 39 right. years old. What does his departure say to you? Uh, listen, we have seen Republicans especially who have gone up against the status quo, whether that's Donald Trump himself or things that the Donald Trump wing of the party would like to see passed, if they've gone up against that, they've usually been on the losing end, either losing a primary or realizing the writings on the wall, they may lose a primary and so deciding to retire. Mm -hmm. He's also unique in that he is a conservative Republican who really does believe in working across party lines on the China uh, committee, for example. Remember this right now, if you look at recent Pew polling, what we see, the difference between how Republicans and Democratic voters see the issue of compromise is very different. Republicans see this as something that shows basically a sign of weakness. Democrats don't see that similarly. Tam, it's also, as, as Amy mentioned, he's done a lot of bipartisan work to counter China's influence. We also have the fact that future funding for Ukraine is very uncertain in the House right now. Are we seeing a more isolationist stance already take hold in the House as we move towards an all but certain Trump nomination? Mm -hmm. Former President Trump is making foreign policy a place where he is exerting his power over the party and exerting his p power over members of his own party who are in Congress. Now, part of that is because this this supplemental for funding for Ukraine and Israel and countering China and, and all of this is is basically the only thing happening right now in mm -hmm. Congress. And so this is where Trump is able to uh, try to influence the party. But also, this is where he has taken the party. Um, it, it is a much more isolationist party under him. And you can see the split. Uh, the split is playing out in the Republican primary, where there is Donald Trump, and then uh, there's Nikki Haley. And Nikki Haley's ceiling is somewhere around 30%. And many of those voters are the voters that 
are continue to be more traditional Republicans mm -hmm. uh, who are more concerned about America's place in the world. You know, she's out there talking about how you need to fund Ukraine. Um, that is not a popular view in Trump's Republican Party. And so you're seeing that split out on the campaign trail where she is really struggling uh, and where Trump Republicans are like, why would we support someone like that? She's just like George W. Bush, um, who was his party standard bearer for a long time. Right. You know, right. but the one thing to say, well, I do think it, the ranks have been thinning in Congress of yes. Republican internationalists. There were still 18 Republicans mm -hmm. who supported the supplemental funding in the Senate. So it's not so that an wing's insignificant, not right, it's no. not an insignificant number, but it's yeah. certainly uh, not as large as it was 20 years ago. Meanwhile, in the potential rematch between President Biden and former President Trump, we, sh we should note the headlines that have really dominated since last week's special counsel report from Robert Hur was released uh, about, have really been about President Biden's memory function, about his age after special counsel Hur included his own assessment in that report. Former President Trump, meanwhile, continues to mix up world leaders, even U.S. leaders, often over the course of his long speeches. He often veers in and out of coherence. It doesn't generate the same headlines, though, Tam. So is there sort of an asymmetry of expectations at play here? Well, there is an asymmetry. Part of that is that one of these people is the current president of the United mm -hmm. States. And so President Biden gives a speech. Typically, his speeches are bite-sized enough to be carried live on television, and they are carried live on television. People see the president when he speaks because he's the president of the United States. Uh, former President Trump is a former president. He's running for running again. He's a candidate. He's basically his party's presumptive nominee. He gives these two hours speeches that go on forever and ever and ever, um, veer off in all kinds of wild directions, include um, things that you can't put on television because the FCC would come after you. Um, and people aren't seeing it. Mm -hmm. um, former President Trump is putting out massive amounts of content that no one is seeing. Uh, current President Biden is not putting out a lot of content. Um, he is pretty limited in his public engagements, um, and everybody sees it. And so it gets a different level of focus, in part because he's the president. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And what you're seeing, too, in the polling is th there's a reason I think Democrats are not as engaged in this election as they were, say, going into 2020. Some of it, that is, there's reticence among Democrats about the president's age mm -hmm. and uh, his ability um, to, do, to, to do his job because of that. But the other is that when Donald Trump was in the White House, he was in your face every day all the time. Mm -hmm. And that is what motivated those voters to show up and vote in 2020 more than it was a sign of their sort of enthusiasm for Biden. I was looking at polling recently and the percentage of people who say they're voting for Biden because they don't like Trump isn't much different than what it was in 2020. Mm. So, you know, that has always been the underlying sort of energy behind the Biden campaign. But you need Trump to be more in focus, which is why the campaign is going to try to make that. Tam, clear. Republicans do jump on any Biden misstatement, though, and will fundraise off it immediately. Yeah. And yes. Democrats and the Biden campaign don't do the same. Is that a deliberate attempt? They actually are doing a fair bit of it, and they are ramping up more. They, you know, have Twitter accounts. President Biden is suddenly on TikTok, though, with a firewalled phone that is not his. Um, but there, you know, in in the sort of conservative world, there are memes born every second that go out uh, on social media, memes about Biden being old, meme, 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 meme. Um, there isn't the same culture of just, like, putting all that content out by average Democratic voters. All right. Well, we'll wait and see. Amy, Walter, Tamara, Keith, always great to see you both. Thank right. you so much.